My friend, as I write to you, my companions and I are finally able to rest, knowing that our journey is nearly complete. I wanted to share with you all that we've seen in order to make a record of our adventure. It has been a long and arduous mission, but what we have seen and experienced has left us completely transformed. Our hearts are so full of joy and we are still in awe and wonder of what we have witnessed. I have so many thoughts running through my mind. Allow me to continue with our story. As you know from our time learning the Hebrew Scriptures, the Book of Numbers told us that a star would rise in Jacob, indicating the birth of a new king of Israel. When we saw the star appear, we knew that this prophecy had come true and started to gather what was needed for the journey. The prophet Isaiah were told that gifts would be offered to this new king. We selected three gifts to bring with us. The first gift we chose to offer to this king was gold. With great anticipation, we began our quest. Would we really come face to face with the long-awaited king of the Jews? We couldn't help but wonder. An epiphany. Have you ever had one? Like, I love epiphanies when I think about it. It's this, this moment of insight or inspiration that comes to us. Uh, and, and it feels like it comes maybe a little bit out of the blue. Um, some people may actually say like um, when they're eating avocados for the first time and they think, oh my goodness, this is really good. I never liked these before. Actually, one of the definitions of, of epiphany is people discovering they like avocados, which is normal because those things are green like bad pork, right? Like that's, that's hard to turn your eyes to and think, I'm gonna eat that green thing, but avocados are delicious. By the way, just an FYI, if you want a real epiphany, go to um, 205, the little coffee shop in downtown Holland, and get their avocado toast. Bring your checkbook. It's not cheap, but it's the best avocado toast I've eaten in, oh my goodness, yeah. You'll thank me later. Just send me a card. Um, but uh, maybe you've had these, like the middle of the night epiphanies. I don't know about you, but uh, oftentimes I go to bed and my brain is swirling on something. And it's usually swirling on the last uh, crisis, major or minor, that has uh, befallen our life. Like one of the things that kind of triggers my heart and emotions in negative ways is when a check engine light comes on. When that little engine block with the little fan on the front, blink comes on on your car and you're like, oh, what is that doing? And you go home and you don't have time to, you know, like worry about it that night. And you go to bed thinking about this, this check engine light and all the things it could mean and how many thousands of dollars it's going to cost to fix. And um, unless you're a teenager and all the lights are constantly on on your dashboard, but um but when that happens, you think, oh my goodness, what's wrong? Um, maybe I haven't paid this car off yet and you're thinking about it and you have an epiphany as you're going to sleep. And, and in the morning you wake up and you're like, you know, your epiphany on how to fix it makes no sense. But in the moment you're like, oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bake banana bread for the whole community. And then in coming together, we'll understand better how to fix my truck or whatever. And then you wake up in the morning, you're like, what was that? It was the weirdest epiphany ever, but you're, you're so sure of it. You have this deep thought, you know, you're like frogs, both on land and sea, they are a universal animal. And you go to sleep and you wake up the next morning, you're like, what's wrong with me? Because you have a weird middle of the night epiphany. I've had these before, it's awesome. But here's the thing. When we talk about the epiphany, uh, there is a theological context to it, and we're going to jump into it here in a little while. But I want to um, to take you to a moment where Israel looked around at their life and called out for something because they were different. It's like they had a pretty negative epiphany. They said, give us a king. They cried out long before Jesus was born. The people of Israel during the time of the judges looked at the nations around them and wanted a king. But God had decided that the children of Abraham would be his people. They would have judges and he would be their king. But they couldn't see God. And they didn't, they didn't want um, a king that, was, that felt distant at times. They wanted someone right there. They were going to be distinct from other nations in that they were going to have God as king. 
But they didn't want that. They, they didn't want to be different. How much like us does that sound? Just like us today, Israel didn't want to stand out and be different. And they cried out, give us the king. They wanted a flesh and blood king to rule over them. A human being with all the agency of humanity woven into them. And they wanted to be like the other nations, the other peoples around them. So God would give them a king, but he warned them. He warned them that this king would send their sons to war, that he would tax them and he would take from their fields and their first fruits for his palace. God warned them that um, he would make their children labor for him. God gave them a warning. Morning, yet they demanded a king. Now I know in our hearts we do we start to judge them harshly. We think, what's wrong with you? Why would you do that? God wanted to love you. But we're not that different. We're not that different from them. We frequently put all our hope in a leader, in the presence of a new leader or a hoped leader, one that we're aspiring to maybe have in our world. And the reality is we all have this internal longing. And if you think I'm wrong, then answer me this. Why is politics all we fight and talk about when it comes to the news media? Because we demand a king. We demand someone to rule over us. It, it's something we want. So let's not judge them too harshly, but let's look. Proverbs 29, verse four, it says this. By justice, a king gives a country stability, but those who are greedy for bribes tear it down. Now this was a devotion just this past week, but um, Proverbs shows us that a king can do so much good. In justice, they can rule over and benefit a nation, but vice versa, a bad king can ruin everything can absolutely, it becomes a garbage fire. And you look at it and you realize that, um, that Israel had a, a pretty good king. Their second king was, was good and for the most part, King David. The first king was Saul, second king was David and the Davidic dynasty began and then his son Solomon would follow him. David was a pretty good king. He was a king for Israel. And God promised David that one of his descendants would reign forever over the people, would sit on the throne of Israel over the people of Israel forever. And we can look at the life of David through First and Second Samuel and the kings and the chronicles of the kings. We can look at that and realize that yes, David's rule is in there, but, but the rest of kings and chronicles is kind of a misfort an unfortunate tale of, um, of really bad kings. Even the good ones, you had to look pretty hard for the good that came out of them. So why? Why do we want this? Why do we want this thing? I don't know, but I know this. God gave a king to Israel and there was a king for Israel. And Psalms, in the book of Psalms, the, the chapter 72, Psalm 72 is a, pro, is a prayer for the next king that would follow King David. It is a prayer for Solomon, that's who the next king would be. And in that prayer, we can look and realize that this king for Israel contains prophecies about an eternal king who would come to rule and reign. Read with me as we look at it. Psalm 72, one through four, it says it this way. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people and the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people, save the children of the needy, and may he crush the oppressor. So looking at those first four verses in Psalm 72, we realize the king should do what is right. The king should care for people, provide for them and protect them. A great king is a righteous rescuer. He's not out only for his benefit. He's a rescuer of God's people. And I would say this, the world is still looking for such a king. The world is still looking for such a king. But originally, this king was only for Israel. This, the, the king of the Davidic line was only intended for Israel. And when we look at that, we realize that they are God's chosen people. From Abraham's sons down, they were God's chosen people. But um, what about the rest of the world? What about everyone else? 
And here's the good and wonderful news, that God would have a king for everyone. God would have a king for everyone. Psalm 72 has a twofold meaning within it. It has this twofold meaning and it talks not only about Israel's king, but it also is promising a future king. Now, now imagine this, this, this it's, it's a prayer for the king that's to come, but there's something that reaches out beyond even that next king's life. It's, it's a promise of, of a rescuer that goes on and on, almost in perpetuity. And it, um, it's this future king, a savior, a rescuer. The Messiah is how the Jewish people would say it. The Messiah whose reign would never end. It would be a good king that sat forever on the throne. A king that would be recognized not just by Israel, but by the whole world. Read with me or follow along with me if you have your Bibles. Open them back up to Psalm 72, verse 5 to 11. It says this about this king. Now remember, it's talking specifically about Solomon, but notice how it takes on this prophetic long tone to it. It says, may he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown, a mowed field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound until the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Now, the names of those places that we just listed off in those verses may not mean much to us, but here's the thing you and I need to understand. They are symbolic and symbols matter. Symbols matter. And if you don't think symbols matter, then why do we get so mad when someone tramples the American flag, right? Symbols matter. And the symbolism in this needs to be clear. We need to understand that this is taking on, and I want, I want to grab it and like, I want to see you like see it stretched out a little bit. Not only for Solomon, which this rule is going to be true, but the prophetic tone that verses five to 11 have to stretch this out into a messianic promise, a promise of the eternal king of David's line, of which Jesus is of David's line, and, and recognize this Messiah who would come into the world would be a king for all people. See, it's symbolic in, in the sense that um, they're pointing to different lands, right? It, the, the, I wanna make sure I communicate this clearly. So Tarshish, it would be famous later in the Bible because of Jonah and a certain large fish. Makes you wanna sing the song, are you in the big fish? But we're not gonna do that. Um, so, so you have Tarshish, which is far away, and then you have Sheba and Seba. And really what these lands are symbolic of is um, lands that are distant, that go to the corners of the earth, they're far away, but also they are lands um, that come up out of the spice trade so the, the trade routes that bring spices around um, the known world. And uh, Sheba was specifically known for having really good gold. Sheba had really good gold in it. Now, it's funny because when we look at this, um, we, we remember that King Solomon was given gold by the queen of Sheba who came to hear his wisdom. If you remember that in the stories of the kings, you can remember that Solomon had the queen of Sheba come to hear his wisdom and she brought a tribute, a gift to him of gold, which their gold was renowned for its excellence, purity, and quality. So when we look at this, we can be like, oh man, that's interesting. But it's more than just interesting. It's funny, Erica and I were talking about this as we were working on this teaching together. And, and she was just telling me, she's like, um, why? <clears throat> why is this little nugget of the Queen of Sheba bringing Solomon gold? Why is that always in every children's Bible? And I was like this, 
It is? And she's like, yeah. I remember it always being in children's Bibles. And, um, and even wondering like, why is it in scripture? We had this conversation and it's interesting because as we worked on this, one of the things that jumped out to us was that we realized that this is part of the Christ story. <clears throat> the idea that um, Sheba, a royal person, a royal, now in this case, a queen coming to see Solomon, brings a tribute of gold to Solomon, the king of Israel, and the wise men bringing gold in tribute to the eternal king, the Messiah who would rule not only out of the line of David, but over all the world, would be given a tribute of gold once again. We can look at this and recognize that these lands that were famous for spices, jewels, stones, and distant travel, these things actually echo forward. They give us a, we can, we can hear the story of Solomon and be like, wait a minute. There was another king who was, promised, and he would be given gold, pure gold from these wise royals, the kings of the East. And we look at that and remember that we have been talking about this epiphany, this moment where we're like, oh, oh, wait a minute. And we can hear the echoes of scripture and we can see a prophecy coming to fulfillment in Psalm 72. And I told you that our understanding of this word epiphany um, isn't the main or original definition, right? They have definitions like people eating avocados and being like, oh, I didn't know I liked those, epiphany. Right, But if you look at it, the, the word actually means, if you look up epiphany, it means the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. That is the epiphany. The manifestation, the embodiment of the Son of God, the seed of David, this, this Christ child, the, the manifestation of that, of Christ to the Gentiles, which is represented by Christ when he encounters as a baby, the Magi coming to him. It's the epiphany. It's the moment where like, oh, this isn't just for Israel. This is for everyone. And that the idea of who, who Jesus Christ was, the idea that the wise men coming to, to visit Jesus was part of God's detailed plan and the giving of gold to the King Solomon from Sheba and the understanding that these wise men coming from far off lands to give a gift of gold, it, it would um, illuminate a, a sense of tribute being paid. When, when a king was paid tribute in ancient days, and this isn't just in the, the Middle East, you go back and study the history of Britain and find out what a Dane geld is. A Dane geld was hundreds of pounds of gold paid by the British to the Vikings who had been um, overrunning uh, like Thorkel, the tall and these different people. Like they would come and demand a, a Dane geld, a bunch of gold as tribute for them not to come in, ransack their land and burn their crops. So we look at this and understand the idea of gold as tribute to a ruler and Jesus receiving from rulers, from these wise men from the East, Jesus receiving gold as tribute really matters. It said so much more in this, well, I think the thing that um, I like to hold on to in this is the wise men coming to visit Jesus is a symbol of something that is so much bigger than I think they understood that I think Mary and Joseph understood. I think what God was seeing in the big picture had to be so exciting because it was so much more than a few stargazers from Persia coming over to visit because they were curious at what was going on in the heavens. I think it was so much more than that. Jesus was worshiped, but he was worshiped by three distinct groups of people. And I think it points to, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, Erica came up with this and as we were talking, she had an epiphany and I thought it was great. She said this, she said, he was worshiped by three dis distinct groups of people. The first were the common and poor people, the shepherds. The second was the faithful few, Simeon and Anna in the temple. And the third was the outsiders, the wise men the people on the fringes, 
the people who were elect and faithful and then this group of outsiders that come in and they illuminate all this imagery of Christ as king through their tribute of gold. The wise men visiting Jesus show us that this was no longer just a king for the Jews. This was a king to rule over the world, the king of the universe, the king of kings. Psalm 72, 12 to 14. It says it this way. I love this part. Like, I love the fact that this is written in David's day. And it's talking, literally talking so clearly about the person of Christ. It says this, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. Precious is their blood in his sight. It's such a kindness of God to value their lives, the lives of people who have no renown in this world, and to say that he will take pity on the afflicted and those who are weak and needy. And you may not think of yourself as that, but in light of eternity, we find ourselves weak and needy, weak in that we cannot earn our own salvation, and needy in the fact that we so deeply need to be redeemed. We need to be forgiven and made new in Christ, and we need to be transformed and we can't do it on our own. I even just said it, in Christ. It's so ground into me that the only way that we can get this need of salvation met is in Christ. And our blood, our life is precious in his sight. It is so precious that he would spill his own blood on our behalf. It is unique among the emphasizing of the king's role in defending and protecting the weakest in society, that we look at this and realize that this psalm ultimately points to the greatest descendant of David and of Solomon. It ultimately points to Jesus, the Messiah, who perfectly fulfills the image of king in this psalm. Solomon couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, all the others that would follow, none of them could do it. Not even Josiah and his great reforms. None of them could do it. None of them could fulfill the image of king that is seen in Psalm 72. But there would be one who would come and he would be of the line of David and he would be born to a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that girl had that little boy in that stable, Kings from the east would come and they would give gold and they would pay tribute to him, king of kings. We look at this and understand that this is a modeling of the concern God has for the helpless in this world. For those who don't have a voice, that we are to be an advocate for them just as he has been an advocate for us. And he, not, he doesn't just help the physically needy. Jesus is the high king of heaven who cares for our deepest need, our eternal need. I just hinted at this a minute ago. He rescues us from Satan. We need to understand the terrifying image that is our lives in the hands of Satan who comes to steal and destroy. How frightening is that thought? How frightening is the idea that we could be living a life that seems pleasurable now, but it's actually in the hand of one who seeks to destroy us versus the fact that we have a king who's come to rescue us, who who sees us as precious in his sight. And Jesus provides for us salvation from the grasp of the enemy. He provides for us a hope that goes beyond this life and a restoration of our relationship with our heavenly father. Jesus Christ is not only king, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the high king of heaven who came down on our behalf. And I want you to get a picture of this king, not only the lowly babe lying in a manger who is needing the attention of a mom and a dad, But I want you to see this king as he is in scripture. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. It says this of Jesus who will return. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many 
crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows except himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is a title given to the conquering Christ who by his life, by his death and by his resurrection, he was given the title that he earned, King of Kings. When we look at the Christmas story, we have the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit of the word of God that tells us that this baby born lowly in a manger is not going to remain there forever. He would live a life serving the marginalized of society and redeeming to himself, not just the people of Israel, but all the world would be invited into this covenant and he will return. And when he returns, he returns as as king of kings. Solomon is known as the great king of Israel because in the day of Solomon, it says that silver was as common in Jerusalem as gravel. It was the wealthiest time in the history of that nation. And Jesus Christ exceeds, oh man, in ways that, that Solomon can't even compare that standard. Jesus Christ exceeds it in every way. Friends, our lives, our lives are in service to the King of Kings. Our lives are everyday, ordinary, living, breathing, eating, serving, loving, connecting, watching, engaging lives are to be lived in praise forever and ever to the King of Kings. Think of that. Your life is to be lived in praise forever to the king of kings, like a tribute of the finest gold given to a king is your life in his hands. Pray with me. God, ah, it's too big for our minds to conceive of. It's too much for us to be able to, um, to grab onto and realize just how marvelous it is that the King of Kings has called us precious, has called us his own. And you were God over Israel and you gave them a king, not for them, but then not just for them, you gave them a king in Christ who would be king of us all and call us back to you. God, thank you for calling us back to you. Thank you for giving us a hope that goes beyond this life. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you. Lord Jesus, the King of Kings, amen.